We're going to start this morning as we uh, usually do with reading from Scripture, and today will be Acts chapter 25, verses 1 through 12. While we all stand for the reading of God's Word. Festus, then, having arrived in the province, three days later went up to Jerusalem from Caesarea. And the chief priests and the leading men of the Jews brought charges against Paul, and they were urging him, requesting a concession against Paul, that he might have him brought to Jerusalem, at the same time setting an ambush to kill him along the way. Festus then answered that Paul was being kept in the custody at Caesarea, and that he himself was about to leave shortly. Therefore, he said, let the influential men among you go there with me, and if there is anything wrong with the man, let them prosecute him. After he had spent not more than eight or ten days among them, he went down to Caesarea, and on the next day he took his seat on the tribunal and ordered Paul to be brought. After Paul arrived, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood around him, bringing many and serious charges against him, which they could not prove. While Paul said in his own defense, I have committed no offense, neither either against the law of the Jews, against the temple, or against Caesar. But Festus, wishing to do the Jews a favor, answered Paul and said, Are you willing to go up to Jerusalem and stand trial before me on these charges? But Paul said, I am standing before Caesar's tribunal, where I ought to be tried. I have done no wrong to the Jews, as you also very well know. If then I am a wrongdoer and have committed anything worthy of death, I do not refuse to die. But if any of these things, but if none of these things is true of which these men accuse me, no one can hand me over to them. I appeal to Caesar. Then Festus had conferred with his counsel. He answered, You have appealed to Caesar? To Caesar you shall go. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day. We thank you that we can gather here to hear from your word, to worship you, and to fellowship together. We ask your blessing upon our, our time together today. Help us, Lord, to keep our mind on you, learn from you today, and trust you for all that we need. As we thank you in Jesus' name, amen.
Well, thank you, Bob, and good morning, Community Bible Church. Uh, grace and peace to you from God our Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. Should I move this microphone, by the way? Are we okay? All right. Gonna get, it's going to get twice as loud if i got two microphones here. All right. Thank you. Well, Sutherland Springs, Texas is a sleepy, sun-bleached town just east of San Antonio. It sits off Highway 87, and it's a, it's a fairly small town. has only 600 residents. has a gas station, a tire shop, a thrift store, and like any good sit town in the Bible Belt, it has a church. It has First Baptist Church of Sutherland Springs. And First Baptist Church of Sutherland Springs is, is housed in this little white clapboard building that's surrounded by, by tall grass and unevenly paved roads. And like a typical Southern church, it has a worship center, it has classrooms for kids, and it has an area out front where you can picture there have been many church barbecues and church picnics and church fellowships after service. But First Baptist Church of Sutherland Springs has something different, something that not all churches have. It has what's called a memorial room. It has a memorial room to honor the memories of 26 people who used to attend that church. See, on November 5th of 2017, on an overcast and already humid Texas morning, a young man named Devin Kelly showed up at First Baptist Church. But Mr. Kelly didn't show up to worship or to fellowship with God's people. Instead, Mr. Kelly showed up to kill. He arrived with an assault rifle, and this dishonorably discharged Air Force cadet ended up slaughtering 26 people, men, women, and children, indiscriminately, who had done nothing but show up to worship. He injured 20 more. This event, this horrific event, still is, to this day, the largest mass-scale shooting in Texas state history. Devin Kelly would eventually flee the church on foot, making his way through pools of blood in this smoke-filled air, just running out of the church facility. But he didn't get far, because an armed citizen chased him down, with it, and he was ready to, to fire as well. Well, Devin Kelly didn't get far. He, was, he, was, he collided with this man, and rather than face up to what he had done, taking the lives of 26 people made in the image of God, ripping families apart, leaving a gaping hole in this church community, Devin Kelly, in an ultimate act of cowardice, took his own life. The pastor of First Baptist Church of Sutherland Springs is a man named Frank Pomeroy. Frank Pomeroy wasn't there that day. He was out of town that Sunday. But he wasn't spared the consequences of that horrific morning. See, in addition to being a pastor of all the congregants who had experienced that day, Frank Pomeroy's daughter was there that day, Annabelle, a 14-year-old, and she was one of the victims, one of those who was killed. So Pastor Pomeroy was not only grieving that morning and later as a pastor, he was grieving as a father. Later that week, a news reporter would come up to Frank Pomeroy and put a, a microphone in front of him and ask him how he was doing. How was he processing all that had happened at his church and in his life over the week before? And Pomeroy, Pastor Pomeroy, said these words, through tears. He said, I don't understand, but I know my God does. We've all been there. When I say that we've all been there, I don't mean that we've been at church services where we've witnessed bullets flying and blood splattering and, and glass breaking. Praise the Lord for that. But what I do mean is we've all been in situations invol involving varying degrees of heartbreak and pain and worry and distress and despair. We've all wrestled with those issues that Pastor Pomeroy was wrestling with that morning with a news anchor's microphone underneath his chin. That question of how can evil and strife and difficulty exist in a world that's created and upheld by an infinitely good and gracious Heavenly Father. This morning, we're going to be in the, bu the book of Habakkuk, where we're going to encounter an Old Testament prophet who was wrestling with the very questions that I've just mentioned, and that Pastor Pomeroy was wrestling with that morning. 
And what we're going to see from this prophet of God is that he was a man who, like Pastor Pomeroy, was shaken yet sure. Shaken by the difficulties and the despair of this life, but sure in the hope and the promises and character of the God he served. I'm going to give you time to get there. It's right between Nahum and Zephaniah, if that helps you guys at all. <laughs> Maybe a better reference would be to say, go to the Gospel of Matthew and turn back five books. Five books to the left from the Gospel of Matthew. Habakkuk, as, as I'm sure you've heard it, with different teachings that happen around this, this church, is one of the, the 12 so-called minor prophets. But Habakkuk's prophecy is not minor in terms of the content that he authored. Rather, it's minor in, sen in the sense of the author's economy of words, meaning Habakkuk is a short book. It has only three chapters and 56 total verses. And today our focus will largely be on the end of Habakkuk's writing. And as we're going to see, as Habakkuk, having verbally wrestled with God throughout much of this book, he finally gets to a place where he's willing to wait quietly on the Lord and to trust joyfully in his God. If you're not there already, let's look at the last four verses of Habakkuk chapter 3, verses 16 through 19. God's word reads, I heard and my inward parts trembled. At the sound my lips quivered. Decay enters my bones. And in my place I tremble, because I must wait quietly for the day of distress, for the people to arise who will invade us. Though the fig tree should not blossom, and there be no fruit on the vines, though the yield of the olive should fail, and the fields produce no food, though the flock should be cut off from the fold, and there be no cattle in the stalls, yet I will exult in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength, and he has made my feet like hind's feet, and makes me walk on my high places. For the choir director on my stringed instruments. Now, before we jump right into the end of the story, that's no good way to read a book, right? You don't just jump into the, the end of the conclusion and think that you have it all figured out. What we're going to need to do is survey some of the landscape of what Habakkuk was dealing with, the situation he was addressing, and, and, and the verses that precede the verses that I just read for you. So we know nothing, actually, about Habakkuk, this prophet, this Nabi, except what he has given us here in the word. We know that he was a prophet to the two, the two southern tribes of Judah, meaning Judah and Benjamin. We know that he wrote this book sometime toward the end of the 7th century BC. And that's important because that would make him a contemporary of the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah, unlike Habakkuk, wrote the longest book of the Old Testament in terms of number of Hebrew words used. And you might remember if you've read or encountered Jeremiah, that in that book, that prophet, the weeping prophet, gives this heartbreaking account of the demise of the southern tribes. If you've spent any time studying the history of Israel and Judah and the decline that those nations, the nosedive they took in these very centuries, you know that sin was rife. Idolatry was open and rampant and was being committed on every high hill, under every green tree, and under the Asherah pole. Those are the references we see all over this part of the scripture, the, the snapshot of history at this particular point in time. This was a time of gross moral deterioration. Now, the 10 northern tribes of Israel at this point, the time of Habakkuk's writing, have already been carted off and taken into captivity by the Assyrians. And now we have these two remaining southern tribes who are on the verge, on the cusp of being taken into captivity as well by the Babylonians in the case of Benjamin and Judah. It's into this historical setting, this nation that's on the verge of being taken away from the only land that they've ever known, that Habakkuk is now writing. And as we're about to see, this book is organized around three major sections, three major discourses where the prophet is going back and forth with God, questioning God, arguing with God, bringing up questions and objections and debating with God as to God's will and his purposes, not only in Habakkuk's life, but in the life of God's people. Let's actually turn to the front of the book that we're in, Habakkuk chapter 1, and we're going to see, I'm not going to read all of this, we're just going to take snapshots and I'm going to paraphrase to kind of catch us up to, to the verses that we're actually going to be in today. But the first discourse between 
the prophet Habakkuk and God goes from chapter 1, verse 1, all the way down to verse 11 of chapter 1. That's discourse number 1. And in this section, the prophet is complaining to God about all the injustices he sees around him in Judah. He's complaining to God, Habakkuk is, about his own people. He's seeing the people of Judah, and he sees violence. He sees iniquity. He sees wrong and destruction. He sees strife and contention and injustice. And, and in a sense, again, I'm going to be paraphrasing as we're, we're hop, skipping, and jumping over these verses. Habakkuk is asking God, God, why aren't you punishing this people? Why aren't you punishing your people? He's already seen, again, those 10 wicked tribes taken away from the north. And now Habakkuk's asking God, why aren't you taking away the two tribes in the south? Why are you reserving judgment on this wicked people? And he's not only concerned that God is not taking away the tribes of Judah, he's actually getting worked up and agitated about God not doing so on Habakkuk's timeline. In fact, if you look at verse 2 of chapter 1, look at these words. These, this is the, the, these are the words of Habakkuk to God, the God that he has been charged to proclaim. Verse 2, he says, How long, O Lord, that sounds like Psalm 13, will I call for help and you will not hear? I cry out to you, violence, yet you do not save. We need to, to take a moment to appreciate the gravity of the accusation that Habakkuk is making here toward God. He is accusing the omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent creator of all things of not hearing. He's saying to God, in effect, your ears are stopped up and you do not hear. He's accusing the author of salvation, of having a divine arm of salvation that's too short to save. Can you imagine? Think, of, think about this. This is, this is a man that's been charged to proclaim the perfections of Yahweh, and now he's turning back to Yahweh and undermining those very perfections in his complaint. He certainly knew better than to make such ludicrous accusations against the God he had been charged to serve and proclaim. And God, frankly, had every right at this point to strike Habakkuk dead for making such accusations and statements of irreverence against him. But he didn't. Instead, God actually provides a response, and that happens in verses 5 through 11 of chapter 1. And in a sense, in essence, what God is saying in this response to Habakkuk is this. Yes, Judah has not been taken away yet, but they will be. There, and, uh, and the Chaldeans are the ones that are being raised up. That's what's said in verse 6. And the Chaldeans, also known as the Babylonians, they were this rising political force in the world. And they were fierce and they were brutal. And they had been appointed by God to be the human agent that he was going to use to, to, to discipline and chasten his people. In other words, unlike Habakkuk's accusa accusation in verse 2, God was going to use an agent. He was going to punish and discipline Judah. And there's a lesson for us here as we put ourselves in the shoes of Habakkuk that, that God is not some aloof deity who is loosely connected with the affairs of this earth. God, the God of Scripture, the God revealed in the Bible, is not some jelly legged being who is afraid to wield his divine hammer of justice at his appointed time, consistent with his perfect will. Rather, what we can be sure of, if our hearts are stirred up, like Habakkuk's was, about the prevalence of sin and ungodliness in the world, we have to trust that God, who is perfectly holy, perfectly righteous, is all the more deeply concerned and offended and will one day unleash his wrath and fury on the sin that exists in this world. In fact, that's exactly what 2 Peter, or 2 Peter 3, verse 7 through 9 says. 2 Peter 3 says, But by his word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. If Habakkuk had the privilege of having 2 Peter 3 in front of him at that moment, he didn't, he wouldn't have believed it. He wasn't buying it at this point in his discourse. 
The answers that God had given Habakkuk in chapter 1 were not satisfying him. In fact, they only bred more questions from the prophet, which we see in the second discourse between him and God. That second discourse begins, by the way, in chapter 1, verse 12, and then it runs all the way to the end of chapter 2. Don't worry, we're not going to go verse by verse through that, or we would be here until dinner time tonight. I'm just going to overview it, okay? But that second discourse from chapter 1, verse 12 to the end of chapter 2, Habakkuk pivots. He's still questioning God, but now his objection is different. Instead of saying, God, why aren't you punishing this people? Now he's questioning God for God's chosen means of disciplining his people, namely bringing in the Chaldeans to overrun Judah. Again, just to paraphrase, Habakkuk here in the second discourse is saying, God, are you really going to allow a people more wicked than Judah to be your means of discipline on Judah? Are you really going to bring in a, a nation that's more wicked to overrun your, your chosen people? How does that square up with you, God, being a just and a righteous God? We see the, we see the essence of Habakkuk's objection at the very end of verse 13 of chapter 1. Look at Habakkuk 1, verse 13, the second part of it. He says, Why do you look with favor on those who deal treacherously? He's talking about the Chaldeans. Why are you silent when the wicked swallow up those more righteous than they? He is asking a Job-like. This is before Job puts his mouth, hand on his mouth and repents in dust, dust and ashes. He's asking a Job-like question right here, a barbed question. The classic, why do good people suffer and evil people prosper question of theodicy. How can and why would a just God allow a wicked people like the Chaldeans to overrun successfully the Judeans? Well, God answers this question and that objection as well. And he answers Habakkuk's second objection in two parts. And the first part of God's object, or response to his objection is simply this. It's the responsibility of the righteous, and it's found in chapter 2, verse 4. Habakkuk 2, verse 4, it's quoted many times in the, in the New Testament. It says, but the righteous will live by his faith. That's your response, Habakkuk. And in our, in our era, that's your response, Christian, to living in response to the trials that God appoints for us. God here is saying to the prophet, you, Habakkuk, your charge is to live by faith. You are not God yourself. You are merely my mouthpiece. You are not to be concerned for how I am going to work all things out for your good and for my glory. And then as through the second part of his response, God's response to the prophet, it, it comes down to this. As for the Chaldeans, don't worry about them. I'll deal with them. They will have their day too. And that's actually the rest of chapter 2 as God proceeds to declare these woes, W-O-E-S, on the Chaldeans. Yes, the Chaldeans are going to have their day in overrunning Judah, but look at these woes that God is now uh, raining down on them. Start with verse 6. I'm going to run through these real quick. There's five woes. Habakkuk 2, verse 6. He says, Woe to him who increases what is not his. The Chaldeans were thieves. And then he says in, in verse 9, Woe to him who gets evil gain for his house. The Chaldeans were covetous. Verse 12, Woe to him who builds a city with bloodshed and founds a town with violence. The Chaldeans were murderous. Verse 15, Woe to you who make your neighbors drink, who mix in your venom even to make them drunk. The Chaldeans were drunkards and immoral. And then verse 19, Woe to him who says to a piece of wood, Awake, and to a mute stone, arise. The Chaldeans were idolaters. What God is saying to Habakkuk by proclaiming these woes on the Chaldeans is this. Yes, I am going to use the Chaldeans to discipline my, my people in Judah. But don't worry. The wicked Chaldeans will face my wrath too. Finally, we get to our third discourse. We're finally backing back into our text for this morning. We get to the third discourse in chapter 3. Look at, and, and this third discourse, look at the first few words of chapter 3. This discourse is different. It says a prayer of Habakkuk the prophet. That's significant because what that shows us is that this doubting and disrespectful prophet has received all the answers to his objections in chapters 1 and 2, and now he finds himself in a completely different posture, in a place of acceptance. 
And not only that, as he reflects in this prayer on God's attributes and God's character and God's works and God's will, Habakkuk now is in this posture of worship. He's in this place where he's able to have the attitude of, God, I don't understand everything. I don't understand why you, why you have allowed the wickedness in, in Judah to happen. I don't understand why you're bringing the Chaldeans in to judge Judah. I don't understand why you're delaying your judgment on the Chaldeans. I don't understand any of these things. But I do know one thing. I know that you are a God who is creator. I know that you are a God who is holy. I know that you are a God who is just and righteous. I know that you are a God who is eternal. I know that you are a God who is unchanging and that you hate sin. And I know that you are a God who harbors righteous wrath toward your enemies while pursuing your people. And I know that you are a God who is a God of salvation. In fact, if you look with me at Habakkuk 3, uh, chapter 3, verse 3, just a few verses here, we'll, we're going to get a flavor of the actual prayer of Habakkuk. Look at uh, chapter 3, verse 3. This is the prayer of the prophet. He says, God comes from Teman and the Holy One from Mount Paran, Selah. His splendor covers the heavens, and the earth is full of his praise. His radiance is like the sunlight. He has rays flashing from his hand, and there is the hiding of his power. Before him goes pestilence, and plague comes after him. He stood and surveyed the earth, he looked and startled the nations. Yes, the perpetual mountains were shattered. The ancient hills collapsed. His ways are everlasting. What Habakkuk is doing in this prayer is praying back to God his attributes. He's reflecting in prayer on who God is, praising him for who he is, extolling him, extolling God for his majesty, his power, his sovereignty, his eternality, and his supremacy. This is not the average prayer for the food or the average prayer for traveling mercies. This is a worshipful, reverent, prostrate, lay flat humbly on your face, crying out to God. This is a prayer that is worshipful, a prayer that magnifies the name and the character of God, a prayer that gets the attention off the one praying and on the one to whom those prayers are being directed. May we all, myself included, be feeling a sting of conviction about the nature of the prayers that we offer up to the same unchanging God. Well, we've circled around it a couple of times, but it's time to get back to our actual text. All that was introduction. We're going to go back to chapter 3, verse 16, and get back to our text, the verses that we read at the beginning. Now, with all of that as background, I want you to note this. The bleak reality of the situation facing this prophet and facing Judah has not changed one bit. The Chaldeans are still advancing. Judah is still about to be sacked and taken captive and taken away, and Habakkuk knows it. He's not cocooning himself from the reality of life and the reality of the situation in front of him. But what has happened is his response, his response to the reality of the dire circumstances facing him and his people. If you're taking notes today, and I think there's points on your note sheet there, point number one, major point for today is this, wait patiently on the Lord. Wait patiently on the Lord. Look again at verse 16. He says, I heard and my inward parts trembled. At the sound, my lips quivered. Decay enters my bones, and in my place I tremble. Because I must wait quietly for the day of distress for the people to arise who will invade us. Now at this point, the Chaldeans are already advancing, advancing making their way to the holy city about to enter the holy city of Jerusalem. You can picture it. The sound of the enemy voices are starting to get louder. The dust clouds that the, that the chariots are kicking up are starting to fill the city. Uh, the sun is gleaming off the spears of these Babylonian invaders as they're getting closer and closer in advancing on Jerusalem. And as all of this is happening, the prophet here is clearly describing the fear that he's experiencing. Let's run through each of these, these ways he describes the fear he's, he's already internally feeling. First, he says, I heard and my inward parts trembled. Now, the word, Hebrew, the word inward parts there is uh, a word beten, 
that, that refers to the, 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 the intestines, the belly, the seat of emotions. In our Western way of thinking, we think of the heart, right? Valentine's Day is where all the seat of emotions lie. In, in the way of thinking in these days, it was our gut, our bowels, our intestines that were, were the, where emotion came from. So some translations, you might have a translation like this that appropriately translate this, my heart was pounding. That's the idea here. He, what's being denoted here is an intense shivering. Habakkuk cannot hide the internal upheaval that he's experiencing. Next, he says, my lips quivered. Other translations, I think fairly translate it, my, my teeth chattered. But that's not because it's cold outside. It's because his nerves are shot. Next, he says, decay enters my bones. He's describing here a feeling of, of weakness, of paralysis, of, of an inability to cope with the situation that faced him. And then he says, and in my place, I trembled. He's describing here his legs turning to jello. He's getting weak in the knees. What, what, what's being conveyed throughout verse 16 here is that from his lips to his legs, there was no part of Habakkuk's body, his physical makeup, that was exempt from the fear that was overtaking him. But this was not an ungodly fear of man he was experiencing. This was not a sinful fear he was experiencing. And said this is what theologians would call natural fear. The kind of fear that we have all experienced at one degree or another, at one time or another. The best way I can explain it is this way. If you've ever been walking down a dark alley late at night in a rough part of town and suddenly you hear footsteps behind you and that, and that chill goes down your spine, that's natural fear. If you're on an African safari and a lion starts charging you, that's natural fear. You're not in sin for feeling fear when a lion is charging you in the wilderness. It's, the, it's that hair on the back of your neck, chill down your spine sort of fear. And how relatable is what he is describing here, how relatable is that to us today? And specifically in the day and age and the stage of the year 2020 that we find ourselves in right now. Yes, did Habakkuk live 7,000 miles away from where we live? He did. Did he live 2,600 years before we live? He did. But how relatable are these very words? Inward parts trembled, right? Our, our inward parts might be trembling, not because we're about to be taken into captivity, but instead because we're in a place of despair over all that has gone on in the world over the past four and a half or five months. Our, our teeth might be chattering, not because there's an army of invaders advancing on us, but instead because the bills are mounting up and the, and, the, and the debt and the income, or the income is not there to, to match those bills. Our, our bones may be decaying, not because we're about to be ripped away from the only land that we ever knew, but instead because our whole concept of what church life is has been completely upended, right? Over the past four and a half or five months. Friends, I know you are, you're well taught. I know Pastor Ed and Pastor Scott have fed you well. So what I'm about to say is maybe for those who are newer here, but I, I, I want you to never fall prey to the lie that the Old Testament generally or the minor prophets specifically are unhitched, irrelevant, or unhelpful to the modern Christian church. All scripture, 2 Timothy 3.16, from Genesis to Malachi, from Matthew to Revelation, from Haggai to Habakkuk, is profitable for teaching reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. All scripture has been inspired, literally breathed out by God. God didn't hold his breath when giving us the book of Habakkuk. The point is this. Like Habakkuk, we are going to face various trials in the life in which we live. We're going to face trials where, where God allows us to be brought to this place of fear or distress. The New Testament is is replete with references to the trials that Christians will experience. In fact, trials, 1 Peter 4.12, are to be expected in the Christian life. In 1 Peter 4.12, the Apostle Peter says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal or trial among you, which comes upon you for your testing as though some strange thing were happening to you. And yes, our, our trials may bring us to this place where we have these natural feelings of fear, and those trials may bring us to a place where we have these first feelings of anxiety or worry or panic. But what Habakkuk is teaching us is that when we are fearful, 
The remedy for our fear is not to be more fearful. When we are feeling anxious, the antidote is not to be more anxious. That's not going to be what, what gets us out of that cycle of that fear or anxiety or worry. Rather, when we face these feelings like Habakkuk did of, tr- of anxiety or worry or panic, which are promised us, what he teaches us is that we're called to wait. To wait. That's not the answer that most of us would expect. When I'm worried, when I'm fearful, when I'm anxious, when I'm despondent, I'm despairing, you're telling me I'm supposed to wait? I feel like I need to do something. I, there's, a, there's some kind of pull myself up by my bootstraps t- sort of thing I'm supposed to do. Well, the prophet himself, God through the prophet has told us, look at verse 16, that we are to wait. Look at the last couple words of verse 16. It says, because I must wait quietly for the day of distress for the people to arise who will invade us. Now, as I just read, in the original context here, Habakkuk was waiting quietly as he lived this out for the Chaldeans to haul his people away. Though we have a much different context as new covenant followers of Christ, the principle still holds and applies. See, so much of the Christian life is about waiting. Think about it. Waiting for that promotion, waiting for that raise, waiting for that husband, waiting for that wife, waiting for those children, waiting for that loved one to come to know the Lord, waiting for the wrongs of this world to be made right, waiting for Jesus Christ to return, waiting for our resurrection bodies, and waiting for the new heavens and the new earth. A verse that ought to encourage us as we, as we wait on the Lord is one that is actually at the, at the basis of the song that we just heard this morning, Everlasting God. Turn with me a few books to your left to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40 is this profound section of scripture. In fact, if you want a, uh, a real profitable exercise one afternoon or one evening this week, just read through Isaiah 40 through 48 and just behold the character and, and the weightiness of the majesty of God. We won't read it all right now, but look at we will read from Isaiah 40 verses 28 through 31 as a cross reference. It says, "Do you not know? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired. His understanding is inscrutable. He gives strength to the weary, and to him who lacks might, he increases power." Though youths grow weary and tired, and vigorous young men stumble badly, yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles, they will and not become weary. This, this passage is so important for us to consider as we think about what it means to wait on the Lord, because what it shows us is that waiting is not to be confused with passivity. Waiting cannot be confused with passivity. What does it say? It says, those who wait on the Lord will gain new strength. And so much so, it says that they will mount up and they will walk and they will even run. See, the Christian life is not about letting go and letting God. The Christian life is not about Jesus taking the wheel. Instead, the Christian life is about simultaneously waiting and battling. As we wait for the Lord to bring his plans to fruition, we are still working out our salvation with fear and trembling. As we wait for the Lord to bring his plans to fruition, we're still growing in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As we wait for the Lord to bring his plans to fruition, we are still putting on the full armor of God, Ephesians 6, 11, and fighting against the devil and his schemes. Well, all of that is on verse 16. We still have three verses to cover. So turn back with me, if you would, to Habakkuk chapter 3, and let's look at verse 17. So verse 16 is all about the prophet experience things in the present. He is physically experiencing these different uh, maladies, things like his inward parts trembling and decay entering his bones. That's a present reality as he writes verse 16. But as we get to verse 17, now he's looking ahead, looking forward to yet further trials and afflictions that are about to come upon him. Look at verse 17. It says, Though the fig tree should not blossom, and there be no fruit on the vines, 
Though the yield of the olive should fail and the fields produce no food, though the flock should be cut off from the fold and there be no cattle in the stalls. Habakkuk here is painting a picture of famine on the horizon. He's painting a picture here of complete economic collapse in war-torn Judah. He's describing here the total devastation and, and, and ruin of a nation. Now, a few months ago, we might have ex- uh, uh, encountered this verse a bit differently than we do today. We might have said yes and amen to all scripture being breathed out by God and being profitable for us today, but these words might not have clicked with us as much as they do right now. Habakkuk says it his way. We might say something like, though the stimulus check may not arrive and there be no toilet paper on the shelves, <laughs> though, though the masks be pinching around the ears and social distancing is a drag, though my office remains closed and, and the kids aren't going back to school, right? That's, that's how we can take this text and, and see, wow, this thing is jumping off the page at us in the year 2020. There may be no better time than right now to completely relate to what this prophet is saying in his time. And what are we called to do when we experience trials like these? The answer goes all the way back to what we saw in chapter 2, verse 4, when he says, the righteous shall live by his faith. And that's actually point number two if you're taking notes, that we are to trust joyfully in the Lord. Trust joyfully in the Lord. If you're here this morning and you are a blood-bought follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, I have to ask you this question. Are you really trusting God in this season? I'm not asking if you believe in God. Even the demons believe, James 2 tells us. I'm asking if you trust God. See, it's easy to trust God when the fig tree is budding when the crop is growing, when olives are on the vine, when cattle and sheep are in the stalls. It's, it's easy to trust God, maybe in a more modern vernacular, when the fridge is full and the lights are on and the savings account is growing and the world is not in a complete pandemic. But what about when the going gets tough? What about when the rent is increasing while your income is decreasing? What about when a parent dies? What about when a spouse commits adultery? What about when that x-ray reveals that dreaded lump? Where does your trust lie? Is your trust in God and his perfect character and perfect will? Or is your trust in him delivering you according to your timeline, according to your will, because that's what you want him to do? See, for Habakkuk, the particular difficulties that he was experiencing really could have dominated him. They, they really could have driven him away from his ultimate trust in God. They really could have led him to a place where he was in a place of skin, uh, cynicism or skepticism or even fatalism. But what we see as we read all the way to, to the end of the story, to the end of the verse, to the end of the passage, is that that's not where it ends. Look with me, if you will, at the last two verses of our text. After saying there will be no, that the flock may be cut off and there be no, may be no cattle in the stalls, look at verse 18. Yet, I will exult in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength and he has made my feet like hinds feet and makes me walk on my high places. After outlining all of the, the, the distresses and difficulties, difficulties he was already experiencing in verse 16, and then in verse 17, looking forward to what was still to, to come to him, Habakkuk here in these verses now turns the page and puts his circumstances in their proper perspective. And he does so with that very first word of verse 18, which is what? Say it with me. Yet. Yet. Now what's interesting is that word yet in English, it looks like it's its own word. If you were to open up a Hebrew Bible, you won't find that word because that word is actually just a, a little marking on the front of the word I. So in the, there's a word for I in Hebrew, but that word yet is just a little conjunction, a little marking, a little stray, think of the words jot and tittle, just attached to the front of the word I. And though it's so small, it has such great significance here because that little marking, that little conjunction marking is the entire pivot point 
of this text of scripture. Because what we're about to see is that this word yet ultimately shows that Habakkuk's solution to the problems he was experiencing, had, had already been experiencing, and his solution to the problems that were still to face him was not to practice deep contemplation or, 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 or meditative breathing or, or positive thinking or to shove the reality of the situation out of his mind. That was not the solution. Instead, his solution, as is our solution, was to set his thoughts higher on God, to focus more faithfully on his relationship with God, and to, and to trust and understand and realize that his salvation and his strength ultimately come from God. See, Habakkuk could recognize that his inward parts were trembling, that his lips were quivering, that his teeth were chattering, that decay had entered his bones, and yet, say in verse 18, I will exult in the Lord. He could say that all those things were happening. He was falling apart physically and, and yet rejoice in the God of his salvation. He could acknowledge that all those difficulties had befallen him and yet be able to say, the Lord God is my strength. That word yet, though small, I hope I'm making the case, is actually of, of enormous significance. See, there are two ways that not only people in the world, but sadly, people in the church live. The first is the way, the more common way, sadly, of if-then. The if-then way of thinking says this, if everything goes well, if I am prosperous, if no one I love dies, if I am healthy and strong, and if all is going well, then I will trust God. Then I will follow Christ. Then I will get connected to other believers. Then I will spend time in God's word. Then I will pray with him, to him. Then I will become a, 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 a thriving member of a local body of believers. The fatal flaw of that if-then mindset, though, is this, that it feebly attempts to place the sovereign God of the universe under our puny little thumb. And worse yet, what it does is it reveals a heart that is seeped in the idolatrous worship of a so-called God that has been created in our image. That's the, that's the way of if-then, the perilous way of if-then. Compare the if-then way of living to though-yet, the though-yet way of living. The though-yet way of living, in contrast, starts with the presupposition and the understanding that I believe God. And not only do I believe in him, I believe God, and I trust him, and I know him. So though evil exists, though loved ones die, though bad things happen in the world, though abandonment occurs, though despair happens, yet I will wait on him, yet I will follow him, yet I will trust him, yet I will love him, yet I will proclaim him. It's the way that Job said it in, in, in uh, Job 13, verse 15. Though he slay me, yet I will hope in him. Community Bible Church, which part of the book of Habakkuk describes you this morning? Are you at the beginning of the story? That part of the story where he was and you are repeatedly questioning God and his provision and his purposes and his ways? Or instead, are you at the place of this book where he, he eventually got at the end of the book where he was and you are fully submitted and dedicated to living for him no matter what hand you are dealt? Are you at the place where you're willing to wait on God and trust in God and, and even embrace his plans and his purposes? In fact, that's Habakkuk's name means he who embraces. There's always meaning to those names in the Old and New Testament he finally got to that place of embracing God's plans and purposes. And now let me ask you another question. Are you living according to the always flawed, ever disappointing, man-centered way of if-then? Or instead, are you God-centered, firmly rooted, though yet believers? People who may be shaken, but people who are sure. People who are waiting on the Lord, and trusting in the Lord, and able to, at the same time, like verse 18 says, exult in the Lord and rejoice in the God of your salvation. Are you those people who, like James 1, 2, putting into a New Testament context, are able to count it all joy when you experience those various trials? 
If you are, then you can relate to the very last part of verse 19 where it says, and he has made my feet like hind's feet and makes me walk on my high places. Here he's painting the picture of a female deer ascending a mountain, steady and sure-footed, uninhibited and unafraid, full of freedom and confidence as she scales the heights of these high places. That sounds a lot like what we read in Isaiah 40, verse 31, that we shall mount up with wings like eagles, that, that picture of ascending. And that's the joy. That's the assurance that every true worshiper of the living God can experience, meaning those who have been washed and cleansed in the saving blood of Jesus Christ. That's what anybody under this tent has experienced if we have put our trust in him or can experience if we have yet to. Now, I hope as we've worked through this passage, going from chapter 1, verse 1, all the way to chapter 3, verse 19, that you've picked up that this, this is a, uh, a prophecy that ultimately has a, a happy ending in one sense. We, we know it's not happy in the sense that the Judeans get carted off. But in terms of the way that Habakkuk's thought process evolves and changes from the beginning of the prophecy to the end, we see that this is a, it's got a happily ever after feel. He's going from doubting to shouting, from worrying to worshiping. It has this upward arc to it. But as sweet and assuring as this passage is for God's redeemed people, I don't want to mislead anyone sitting here this morning. See, you cannot claim that, that the assurances that these verses provide if you are not, in fact, one of God's redeemed people. If you're sitting here this morning and you are not right with God, meaning you have not submitted yourself to him by bowing your knee to his son, Habakkuk 3.19 is not and cannot be your life verse. Don't go getting a personalized HAB 319 license plate if you have yet to bow your knee to Jesus Christ and to trust in him and him alone for salvation. If I'm talking to you this morning, don't be deceived into thinking that the Lord your God is your strength. Don't be deceived into thinking that you're going to be bounding up any heights like a deer or, or ascending into any eternal high places. No matter how many acts of charity you've performed or good deeds you've done or compliments you have been paid or compliments you've paid, there's no way for you to get around the Bible's teaching that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23, and that the wages of sin, your sin, is death. In other words, if you're planning to or thinking that you can get to heaven on your own merit, your own resume, the reality is you're, you'll never make it. What awaits you is not some eternal existence where you're scaling the heights. Instead, what awaits you is the exact opposite, where we'll, you will experience eternally the bottomless, billowing flames of a real and eternal hell. And you will spend, as I would have spent had I not been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ and anybody here who can testify to that, instead what you will face is eternity as the object of God's just and righteous wrath on you for the sin that you know you have committed. Martin Lloyd-Jones says this in his commentary on Romans, praise God for the butts of the Bible. What he means is this. Many places in Scripture, in New Testament specifically, we see these beautiful words coupled together, but God. I've just testified about the, the, the hell that awaits those who do not trust in Jesus Christ, but God. But God, in his infinite wisdom and mercy and kindness and love and grace, has provided everybody under this tent a way to be made right with him, a holy God, and to avoid that terrifying fate that I've just described. And that's to trust in Jesus Christ. See, Jesus, the Lord, much like Habakkuk, faced a day of distress during his years here on earth. Remember, he was the one that was sweating drops of blood as he prepared to face the cross. We see that in Luke chapter 22. So much so that in, in Matthew 26, he says, my soul is deeply grieved. That sounds a lot like Habakkuk at that point in his earthly ministry. Of course, Jesus, being God, knew that God would never leave him or forsake him, but in his humanity was going through an ordeal, going through difficulty at, of, of an infinite degree. And as he faced the cross, as he made his way to, to Golgotha, he was spit upon and tortured, and whips were laid across his back. 
A crown of thorns was hammered into his head and nails were driven into his hands and feet. And then last, a spear was jabbed into his side. And through all of that and with all of that, he gave his life voluntarily according to the perfect plan and foreknowledge of God so that you and I might enjoy eternal fellowship with him forever. He did all of that, even dying, so that we might live. If you haven't already, I beg you, trust in Jesus Christ to save you. Come empty to the only one who can make you full. Come broken to the only one who can piece you back together. Come humble and contrite to the only one who can reconcile you to a holy God. Repent of your sins and trust completely and fully in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. We'll all wrap up our time this morning by noting, as you see at the very end of chapter 3, that this text is actually a song. I kind of alluded to it when I, when I read the Selah at the beginning of chapter 3, like a psalm, right? Look at the very last few words in, in our Bibles. It says, For the choir director on my stringed instruments. The words that we have just worked through would have been sung at the time they were given. Now, like the Psalms, this section of scripture has actually been motivation for different people to write songs, modern songs for the church to sing. If you've heard of the name William Cooper, most people don't recognize that pronunciation because it's spelled C-O-W-P-E-R. If you've ever seen that name, William Cooper, he's the man who wrote the song that you're very familiar with, I'm sure, There Is a Fountain Filled with Blood. Well, William Cooper also wrote a hymn called Sometimes a Light Surprises. And that's, that hymn, that song, is actually based on our text, Habakkuk 3, chapters, chapter 3, verses 16 through 19. I'm actually going to read a chunk of the, the hymn to close our time this morning, then I'll pray. It says, Sometimes a light surprises the Christian while he sings. It is the Lord who rises with healing in his wings. When comforts are declining, he grants the soul again a season of clear shining to cheer it after rain. In holy contemplation, we sweetly then pursue the theme of God's salvation and find it ever new. Set free from present sorrow, we cheerfully can say, even let the unknown morrow bring with it what it may. It can bring with it nothing, but he will bear us through. But who gives the lilies clothing will clothe his people too. Beneath the spreading heavens, no creature but is fed. And he who feeds the ravens will give his children bread. And then see if this sounds familiar. Though vine nor fig tree neither, their wanted fruit shall bear. Though all the fields should wither, nor flocks nor herds be there. Yet God, the same abiding, his praise shall tune my voice. For while in him confiding, I cannot but rejoice. Amen and amen. Let's pray. Gracious Father, thank you for the truth that you have communicated to your people for all time through your perfect, sufficient, inerrant word. Thank you, God, that we can sit here in Anaheim in the year 2020 and open the book of Habakkuk and see how it jumps off the page in terms of its application and, 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 and link to our day and age. God, you are timeless. You are true. You are good to your people and have always been. May we this morning feel charged to live faithfully for you, though we are in difficult times and, and, and uncharted waters. Help us, God, to be not the, the if-then people of the world who, who love you and serve you uh, conditionally. I should say, we should let us not be the people of the church that do that. But instead, God, help us to be though yet people, that whatever may come, whether it be disease or, or job loss or income loss or ultimately death, we know that you are a good God, that your, per your ways are perfect and sure, and all of your ways are just. 
Thank you for this morning, God. I pray that we would come away encouraged and exhorted and challenged to live more faithfully for you today than we did yesterday. We give you all the praise, honor, and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for another day that we can gather and worship you, that we can hear from your word. Um, sink it deep into our hearts. Remind us, Lord, that you love us and that we can trust in you. We can live as the though yet people. Take us safely to our homes and keep us mindful of your presence throughout our week as we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. We're dismissed.